No single thoroughfare anywhere in the world has provided such a prolific supply of new and exciting songs as that neon encrusted strip. Where else could you match the glitz and glamour of Times Square, 42nd Street, Supper of Sardi? The world is a stage, and the stage is a world of entertainment. There are 36 theatres on Broadway, and in those theatres, the combined talents of some of the world's finest composers and lyricists have given us shows full of music and song that have become part of our musical heritage. And from those shows, we have been able to select what we consider the best, the best of Broadway. Such shows as Oliver. Oliver was written by Lionel Bart, author of a string of highly successful musical comedies. Interestingly, Bart claimed he couldn't write music. When composing, he simply whistled or hummed a tune, and a team of musicians would score it for him. Which just goes to show, you've got to pick a pocket or two.
Show us, show us. Come on, Nancy, you're the free show on the stage. Well, it's like this, it's all. I saw the foul. And hey, don't make the petticoats dangle in the mud, me darling. And I'll go last. No, I'll go last. No, I'll go last.
light on. Your life, little girl, is an empty page that men will want to write on. producing 26 Broadway shows. Before the premiere of this musical version of Lynn Riggs' play, Green Grow the Lilacs, the general opinion was that the show would be a box office disaster. Oklahoma was considered too radical in style. Hammerstein had not written a hit in several seasons. Could Rogers be a hit maker without heart? Well, Oklahoma broke all existing box office records and it held that honor for 15 years. It ran for 2,248 performances. The freshness, the imagination, and the magic of the show held audiences spellbound.
It ain't necessarily so that the critics know best. Gershwin's music blended American styles and a classical structure. The critics had a problem classifying Porgy and Bess. Was it operetta? Was it musical comedy? Was it opera? Who really cares?
Pacific, the show took Broadway by storm in 1949. It eclipsed the success of previous Rodgers and Hammerstein smash hit musicals. It ran for five years at the Majestic Theatre. Not surprisingly, when tickets became impossible to buy, scalpers charged enormous prices. Based on James A. Michener's tale of the South Seas, South Pacific tells the tale of two romances. One is the love affair of a female ensign and a middle-aged French planter. The subplot tells of the tragic romance between a marine and a lovely Japanese girl. The magnificence of Richard Rogers' music is clearly evident in this beautiful love song.
Unlike many of his fellow musicians, he wrote both words and music. According to his biographer, watching Irving Berlin write is like watching a woman in labour. <laughs>
Broadway would be incomplete without the selections of Rodgers and Hammerstein's The King and I. Based on Margaret Landon's story, Anna and the King of Siam, the show was a monumental success in 1951. It returned to Broadway in 1985 and was the only major musical success that year. Yul Brunner was a relative newcomer in the first production. The show gave him stardom. It's whimsical. In 1951, Brunner played beside an aging star, Gertrude Lawrence. In 1985, he was the aging star. <laughs> Yiddish Fiddler. 
The show's Broadway run broke all existing box office records in July 1971, making Hunnick and Bock very rich men.
Low made musical history with a partnership lasting from 1942 until Lerner's death in June 1986. For 44 years they entertained the world with wonderful lyrics and music and scored global smash hits. Actually, Lowe's musical background was classical. At the age of 13, he was the youngest pianist to make a solo performance for the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. He later became a successful composer and concert pianist in Europe. Yet, he fit so readily into the rhythm of Broadway, as is evidenced in Gigi, based on a novel by a French author Colette. The show was both a Broadway hit and a highly profitable film, starring Leslie Caron, Hermione Indol, and Maurice Chevalier. Thank heavens for Lerner and Love. <laughs>
lovely and difficult task, he set into music the ideas of George Bernard Shaw and Pygmalion. As a matter of fact, the first tryout of My Fair Lady at the Schubert Theatre, New Haven, in 1956, very nearly didn't happen. Rex Harrison suffered a paralyzing attack of stage fright and agreed to go on only an hour before curtain time. <laughs> there were also massive problems with twin revolving stages, which broke down intermittently throughout the show. And, if that were not enough, several of the backdrops jammed during the scene changes. But My Fair Lady is the most successful musical comedy ever to reach Broadway. It has played more performances, made more money, and received more rave reviews than any other show. Its initial run was 2,717 performances. It won the Pulitzer Prize, the Tony, and countless other awards. Several years later, it became a big hit in London. The current Australian production is reaping in the profits. Choosing a selection from My Fair Lady was a difficult task. Time prevents us from presenting the entire store. Vicky, wouldn't be good, wouldn't it be lovely? <laughs>
I'm going to track them down in just a few more hours. <laughs> Set them up, me darling! up an exotic South Sea setting. To Rogers and Hammerstein, South Pacific might conjure up memories of the largest sale of advanced bookings on record, the memory of playing to paying standing audience members in its second year of production. And to Rogers, perhaps the memory of writing the melody to one set of lyrics during a lunch break, it took him five minutes. This could be a truly memorable rendition of the exotic South Pacific.
The second longest running Broadway musical to date is Hello Dolly. Based on Thornton Wilder's famous play The Matchmaker, Hello Dolly made Jerry Herman a hit in 1963. Undeniably, the title song is the high point of the show, with its show-stopping vitality. Move over, Louis Armstrong. <laughs>